Hi, this is Dan Lynch. Join me for Floss Weekly, where I'll be joined by guest host Aaron Newcomb, and our guest project is Image Factory, a way of building virtual machines and targeting any cloud platform. So join us next, because you don't want to miss it. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Floss Weekly is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Floss Weekly number 231, recorded Wednesday, October the 31st, 2012. Image Factory. Hello and welcome to Floss Weekly, the show about free Libre open source software. My name is Dan Lynch and I'm your host for this week. Our regular host, Randall Schwartz, is away in the Mediterranean right now, but I am joined by Aaron Newcomb. Aaron, how are you doing? Good, good. Good to see you again, Dan. Yeah, it's good to see you too. And uh, I'm glad uh, you guys are all safe over there on the West Coast because there's some crazy, crazy stuff going on in the States right now. And I'd like to wish everybody who watches and listens to to, uh, to Twit uh, our best wishes, really. I mean, uh, I hope everyone's okay and staying safe out there. Yeah, absolutely. Our thoughts go out to everybody on the East Coast that's dealing with the uh, uh, Superstorm, as they call it, Superstorm Sandy. I know I was talking to a coworker this morning that said, I said, hey, how's this project coming? And he said, uh, I have no power or electricity or water. Uh, it's going to take me a little bit to get this done. Uh, so obviously I, I said no problem just glad you're safe but yeah definitely our thoughts go out to everybody and um, I think we're commiserating here in the Bay Area it seems a little bit uh, cloudy and rainy today so mm -hmm. okay then so uh, today we've got Image Factory is our guest project and we're going to be joined by Steve Lawrence and Ian McLeod from the project and Image Factory is uh, a tool for building your uh, virtual appliances your your virtual machines if you like uh, but targeting them at different cloud providers they uh, they, they give you all the tools so you can build your image uh, and they build it up to a certain kind of level and then target it at uh, likes of EC2, obviously, um, Rackspace, all these other kind of uh, cloud providers. So it sounds really interesting. Have you heard anything about it before, Aaron? Um, I have not. Outside of the Aeolus, we talked about Aeolus, uh, I don't know, 10 episodes ago or something. Uh, it was back in the spring. Um, so I know it's part of that effort, but I don't know a whole lot about it. It is an interesting area, though, just because, you know, obviously cloud is so dominant right now. And anytime you get above, you know, say 20 images or so that you have to manage, or if you're rolling out a new project and you know you're going to need 20, 30 images up in the cloud, I think any kind of software like that that can help and that deployment effort is going to be great. So I'm anxious to hear what they have to say. Okay, so let's go ahead and bring on our guests. We have Steve Lawrence and Ian McLeod. Uh, how are you doing, guys? Great. Good. Thanks for having us on. Excellent. So um, wh where are you speaking to us from right now? Uh, I'm in Chicago. Okay. And I'm also just outside of Chicago. Oh, excellent. Okay. Um, so I would uh, obviously you guys are not affected by the the current uh, hurricane over there. So I'm glad you're keeping safe. Make sure you everyone keeps safe over there. Um, so we're here to talk about Image Factory. So I don't know who wants to start us off, but uh, can you give us an idea and an overview of what Image Factory is and how it works? Who wants to kick us off? Sure, I can I can field that initially. Yeah. Uh, Image Factory is a tool for building uh, operating system images to be pushed to cloud providers uh, with a fairly broad definition of what a cloud provider is. So um, EC2, Rackspace, OpenStack, these are all clouds that people are probably familiar with. We also uh, define things like vSphere and Red Hat's virtualization tool, RevM, um, as a cloud provider. So it's a tool that can build an image from scratch uh, from install media um, modify it and customize it in a variety of ways and then push it up to these providers in whatever format they require, um, which differs quite a bit between them. So that's in a nutshell what it does. Uh, it's meant to okay, so support... Uh, sorry, go ahead. No, no, carry on, carry on. I'm interrupting you there. Carry on. Uh, no, it's part of a larger project called uh, Aeolus, which does um, uh, is a sort of broader cloud, man cloud management scheme. Um, that's also a, a Red Hat project. Excellent. Okay. So, um, what would it, what would be a comparable kind of thing that maybe our listeners might have heard of or seen? Or so, are there any comparable tools out there? Um, there are some similar tools. Um, there's, you know, appliance creation is a problem that um, has been around for a while. There are some tools that. Um, in the past have been used to create live CD images. Um, there's an, another tool 
uh, that's part of the Red Hat JBoss project that's called Box Grinder that does something similar. Um, beyond that, uh, I'm not I'm not really sure. There aren't a whole lot of things uh, that seem to be designed to address this uh, in the cloud context, specifically pushing uh, in particular to the public cloud providers. Uh, it's a relatively new space. Okay, so how did the project come about? What's the kind of uh, problem you were trying to solve, and how did it how did it um, you know how was it born, if you like? Well, so the Aeolus project, the larger project, is designed to be um, a management framework that's fairly cloud neutral. So it's meant to let you um, define images and collections of images and launch them uh, to a variety of clouds without really locking you into anyone specifically. Um, so there's a variety of pieces to that. Image Factory is one of them. Uh, and Image Factory needed to be there in order to let you define an image and what's in it in a fairly cloud neutral way. Uh, but then build it and deploy it to a variety of clouds um, without having to worry about the underlying details. So uh, it's part of a group of projects, group of uh, elements that support the larger Aeolus and CloudForms project. Mm -hmm. and, and what's uh, your role within the project? Uh, so I was uh, originally the, the sole developer, the lead developer. Um, the team uh, has grown since then to be two people. Um, so we're both uh, ba basically um, the software developers for it. Excellent. Okay. So um, yeah, the, there are uh, there are um, some other things around that kind of do similar kind of things. So how does Image Factory kind of differentiate itself? Because uh, creating appliances as a project is a, a problem that's been around for a little while. So what do you guys do differently to to everyone else? Well, so the main thing is that we make uh, pervasive and essentially exclusive use of virtualization and we use the native tools, uh, the native installer and the native packaging tools in whatever our target is. So a lot of other tools in this space um, essentially operate in what you might call an offline mode. So they, you're running in a host environment. Within the host environment you create some loopback file systems, you format them, and then within the host environment you lay down a package set um, using tools within the host environment. This works reasonably well as long as there's not a huge difference between uh, the environment that you're hosting in and the environment that you're trying to create. So for example, we ran into problems with tools that do it this way when trying to build older images with newer versions of Fedora or RHEL. You end up with a mismatches in the way the package database works, um, in the way that some of the meta packaging works. Um, and again, the greater the difference there, the, the more issues you have. So we actually operate in a, in a completely different way. We use the native installation tools uh, and we run them within a virtual machine and then we capture the output. Um, beyond that, another thing that I believe is um, unique to the way we do it is that we don't attempt to customize within the installation tool, whether it's Anaconda or Ubuntu's installer or Windows. Um, we take a known, uh, you know, a an input that is known to work reliably to install the baseline operating system. And then we finish that, and when we're done, we launch it again as sort of a full-fledged version of the guest, and then we do the customization from there, which gives us a much better environment to um, do error detection and be able to provide feedback. So that, in, uh, in essence, is what makes Image Factory different. So do you, uh, so do you, so we, uh, I need to go into that last part a little bit more and maybe get a little bit more clarity. You start with, um, you build the system yourself. Are you like building it up to a certain point and then allowing for customization? So you've got the basic level, so you know it'll work on EC2, for example. You, you know that because you've, you've done the install up to a certain point and then you allow the user to start from there and then add packages and things like that. Is that, is that basically what you're doing? That, that's roughly correct. We, we build it in a, um, a local KVM guest using the native install media up to a very minimal point, just enough that we can launch it again as a full guest and SSH into it. When we do that, we launch uh, the full-fledged operating system and we do further customization, again, as a KVM guest locally. Um, theoretically, we could use other virtualization tools, but right now we use KVM because it's what's most easily natively available on Linux, which is our primary platform. Yeah. Um, and once we've done both of those things, created a minimal install, and then customized it based on what people have asked us to do, then we shut it down and we uh, we have 
the images in a very well understood form on KVM, and then we transform it as necessary to push it up to various cloud providers. So people who are familiar with EC2 might know about the bundling process. We do that. We flatten it um, for dip things like um, RevM or vSphere. We may change the disk image format, uh, things of that nature. Right, right. Is this meant I mean, I, maybe just a point to clarify there too, we're bringing it up to what you would call just enough OS um, mainly not as a common denominator for the clouds themselves, but as a uh, means to make sure that we don't run into issues just at the very outset of trying to install uh, this base image or try to create this base image. So the just enough OS um, approach, you know, gets rid of a lot of variables before you actually go into customization. Right. We want to want to take that out as a one of the problem aspects, you know, before you even get to customization. Right. So things like kernel drivers or settings, um, here I am, uh, things that are, uh, uh, things that you might have to tune or everyone might have to tune when they're setting up, for example, an EC2 uh, VM, you've, you've done that, that base work already. So, you know, you've got the right, uh, the right versions of various drivers or, or whatever that you need, um, the right version of, of, a, of a kernel, for example, to make sure that you, you, you have that baseline, right? And that's part of it, yeah. And the other issue is, I mean, a lot of the installation tools like Anaconda for um, Fedora and Red Hat Enterprise Linux, they do let you do some of this customization, but it's a very difficult environment to do error detection. And you essentially uh, can look for one of two things. If, it's, if it encounters an error, it reports that back interactively to you, but that's very difficult to capture programmatically. So uh, you left, when running it in a VM as we do, you can look for either it shut down, which indicates that it finished correctly, or you have some sort of timeout. There's no real way to get um, detailed information back when there's a failure. So we do, uh, in the case of Anaconda, we have kickstart files that we know work to create minimal installs all the time. And we do that. And then we launch them as full-fledged guests, which we can access via SSH. Uh, and that's a much easier environment to then do error detection. And if people have, you know, fat-fingered the list of repositories or they've misspelled a package name or um, their customization scripts don't work, they produce an error, those are all things that are, are much easier for us to uh, provide feedback on an error correction and detection if we're running in a full-fledged guest. How this I... might be a... Oh, go ahead. Sorry. This might be a good time also to sort of review, you know, the, the process and sort of the concepts that we use with an image factory. So um, what we're talking about right now in terms of building an image, we're talking about in terms of an upload image. There are clouds that, like EC2, supports us actually building our own local image and then pushing it up into the cloud. Um, but there's also, uh, they also have a mode where you can snapshot something that's already up on, in the cloud. And then Rackspace also works in that way where it's only, you can only snapshot. So we have two modes there where you can build one locally, you can snapshot it in the cloud, and then do your customizations that you need in order to make it your web server or, you know, some sort of uh, application server or whatever you want to use it for. Um, then there's also our process and in the case of the, up, of the upload style builds, we use all three parts of this process, which is to build what's called a base image. And that's the, the you know, the basic, um, with all of your custom packages type image that you uh, have created. And then there's a target image, which is actually customized for that cloud specific uh, format. So, you know, the target image would be uh, for EC2, RevM, vSphere, Rackspace, you know, OpenStack. Uh, and then from the target image, you would push that up and that would create what's what we call a provider image. And that would be, you know, you push it up to uh, EC2's, you know, US East 1 or US West 1 or, you know, you have a different data center for RevM or vSphere. Um, those are the, the providers that we're pushing those images into. So that's just a, you know, sort of an overview of the process and the terms that we use with an image factory. Okay. And what, um, I'm just trying to get, if I wanted to, if I wanted to use this, do I need, because we talked about before, and maybe we should talk about this a little bit, the relationship with Aeolus and, and we've had them on the show before. What's the relationship? This is one module basically of that whole package, right? Okay. Yeah, so our relationship with Aeolus is uh, mostly infrastructure. You know, we're, we're, we act sort of like what Delta Cloud acts like with Aeolus in that we provide uh, infrastructure to 
make them more cloud independent, cloud agnostic. So whereas Delta Cloud provides interface for interacting with instances on the cloud, we offer a component where we can create images that can then be pushed to the cloud so that uh, ALS Conductor, as an, as an example, that's the web UI that is administrative, uh, does the administrative actions, um, they can call to us and actually create those images and have them pushed up. Uh, they don't have to deal with any of the specifics of you know each of the different types of clouds. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this is available in Fedora only at this point? Or can you get uh, it on Red Hat as well? Uh, it can run on both Fedora and RHEL, and in fact, it can probably run um, in other Linux environments as well, although we don't we don't test extensively in those. Okay, uh, I, I was just looking at the website uh, on the ALS website when you when you go to get it. Um, you know, it basically just has a yum command to install. Oh yeah, Fedora I'm sorry, I thought, I thought you were asking about the factory specifically. And well, I should well, we should out. we should we should do both, right? So uh, yeah. AOLIS looks like it's it's right now only in Fedora. At least that's the way you get it. Um, but Image Factory, I could download those. Uh, do you have binaries, exam uh, uh, for example, available for, for Ubuntu or um, any of the other distributions? It's, it's certainly easiest to run it on Fedora right now. You, uh, there's no reason why it shouldn't run if you uh, install it from source or install it from Python packages uh, on something like Ubuntu. And in fact, it's our goal to make that a little bit easier, actually package it up and get it uh, formally available. But right now, the easiest uh, environment to use factory is Fedora, and uh, the same is, is uh, it's fair to say, is true for Aeolus as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, so, so this is one part of, um, of Aeolus. Is, what's the status of the software? Would you, is it uh, production? Have you done a, a major version release, or is it still kind of in beta? So yeah, we've, we've done actually. A, go ahead, Ian. Oh, uh, we've done a, a release uh, earlier this year of the overall stack, which is the product is called CloudForms, um, and that is in production. Uh, that's available. We've done a great, uh, quite a bit of development since then in the last six to eight months, and that's uh, what I would call in sort of alpha beta testing at the moment. Um, the upstream project is, and that's for version two of of Image Factory. Oh, we've got Dan on mute, I think. That's okay. He'll come back to us in a minute. <laughs> hello? Can you oh, hear there me? We go. Hello, hello. Sorry about that. Um, I wasn't actually muted. I don't know what's going on there. Um, so one thing I was curious about, guys, is we talked about the status of it in the production stage. Is, is anybody outside Red Hat using this right now? Um, if so, who's using it and, and what kind of things are they doing with it? I'm afraid to say I'm not entirely sure. Um, we know that the overall <laughs> overall product is in use. Uh, we have some early customers, um, uh, you know, on the on the product side of things. Uh, one of the things we've done over the last few months, uh, the, the project originated as part of the of Aeolus and a, a larger software stack. Uh, we've taken some steps over the last few months in the upstream project to make it easier to use it standalone. So we've built up. Uh, a command line interface that's a little more user friendly. Prior to that, uh, it was really only uh, run as a REST service to be used by the uh, the web admin um, side of Aeolus. So, hmm. okay, excellent. And um, how many how many people are working on this? How big's your your team? Is it all Red Hat developers right now? People who are working at Red Hat, or do you get outside contributions? Is that something you look into in future? Well, really, it's just the two of us at the moment. And yeah, we're absolutely ah, okay. open to any sort of uh, outside contribution. There's a number of areas that we're looking to, uh, you know, progress on uh, more support for different operating systems, both, you know, as a, where Image Factory is run and what kind of guests we can create, what kind of images we can create. Um, you know, we <laughs> there's, there's so much, actually. It's such a, a young project that th we would take just about any help that anyone could provide. You know, even anything like cleaning up the design on the website, right? I mean, these are things that mm -hmm. take time and, you know, it's just the two of us and we don't, we honestly don't have the time to do it all. Mm. Excellent. Yeah, I mean, of course, it's, it's a big undertaking when, you, when you're trying to get a project off the ground. Um, so what, have you got a, like a GitHub repo or anything like that? Is, is, the, uh, is this available? How could people get involved if they want to? We are on GitHub and actually mm -hmm. uh, Image Factory is an upstream project first. Uh, so it's not like there's a bunch of stuff, you know, in a private repository somewhere that, you know, eventually makes it into the upstream project. Right now it's all upstream first. 
Uh, so you can find us at uh, GitHub, ALS Project, uh, Image Factory. If you go to imagefact.org, of course, you know we, we point you to all those wonderful uh, ways to get in contact with us. We're on Twitter and Facebook and, you know, Google Plus and all that kind of stuff. So uh, if you're interested in, you know, get involved, uh, reach out to us in one of those ways. Great. Okay. So we, we encourage people to do that. Um, so uh, we talked a little bit about, Aaron was saying about installing it. You've got a, like a, a yum command on your website, but what kind of requirements are there for me to install this maybe in hardware and software and so on? Uh, well, we make heavy use of libvert and libguestfs, so that's uh, those are probably two of the biggest requirements in terms of software. Um, and the nature of what we're doing in terms of virtual machines requires, if you want any sort of, uh, you know, good timeline for building an image, you should really be doing it on bare metal at this point until nested virtualization becomes more widely adopted. Um, other than that, Ian, do you? What else am I missing here in terms of uh, requirements? No, I think you hit the main points. I mean, depending on which cloud you want to build for, there are bindings that um, you need to install. Those are part of our RPM dependencies right now. So there's a project called Botto that we use to talk to EC2. Um, there's a comparable project for um, talking to Rackspace, and there are some bindings also for uh, vSphere, you know, vCenter, and RevM. So uh, those are all, you, you don't need those unless you want to build for those particular clouds. Um, but those are some of the other things we require. Main thing is and that to do upload builds, you really need to be running on bare metal. So if you, you can't really test it in a virtual machine effectively. And one thing I'll say too is, uh, you know, Ian mentioned the bindings for specific clouds. Uh, we do offer a plugin style interface so that, you know, if all you want to do is build for EC2, you could just install the Image Factory core and then uh, the plugins for whatever OSs you want to install and just that cloud. Uh, but it also means that, you know, people that are very knowledgeable about specific clouds or specific OSs can contribute by creating plugins that are independent of the project and distributing, you know, them independently of Image Factory so that more people can take use of, could make use of Image Factory and, uh, you know, create Im operating system images for whatever clouds available. Hmm. I mean, yeah, that's a good point, actually, because you're talking about um, you, you can target a lot of different cloud providers. Does that create challenges for you? Because I imagine, obviously, there are different requirements for each one. Those could change maybe outside of your control. So what, what are the kind of challenges for you guys in, in working with so many different targets, if you like? So, I mean, the, the biggest challenge, we need to have some way to communicate with it. At the moment, we found uh, the project is based in Python, it's written in Python. Uh, there have generally been uh, language bindings available for us to talk to the APIs that these clouds provide. Um, each cloud is different in the format that it expects the image to be in, uh, EC2 probably being the most challenging. So um, there's various transformations that we need to do when you're doing an upload style image. Um, as we mentioned a little bit earlier, uh, some of the public clouds simply don't support uh, uploading arbitrary content uh, as a sort of fully baked image. So the other thing we're dependent on is a relationship with those providers to have them give us the minimal images, the sort of starter images uh, that we then log into and modify in a, in a similar way that we do if they're local. So um, we have that on EC2 for both RHEL and Fedora. Um, we have some of that on Rackspace. Uh, and, you know, we're in, in the early stages of trying to arrange that kind of thing on some of the other public clouds. Hmm. And, and do, do you think, I mean, I, sp I know you're in the early stages right now, but do, do things ever change on their end that, that kind of can break things for you and cause problems? Because I'm just thinking that you're working with a proprietary system here on the other end in some cases, um, which you don't have, you know, as much control over. Does that ever cause you any kind of problems so far? We've had some issues. Um, for example, vSphere um, has introduced new features over the three, four, and five version timeframes that um, have changed the way that we need to specify the virtual machine that we're uploading to. Um, there have been some changes on EC2 that have actually, uh, frankly, made life easier for us. Uh, it used to be the case that EC2 images were always separated into a distinct kernel image, RAM disk image, and file system image. And you had to make sure that there was uh, the appropriate versions of each available for the image you were trying to build. They have in the last couple of years, I think it was about 18 months ago, actually, that they added this, um, something that essentially simulates the behavior of Grub 
on, mm. on Linux-based images. So mm. we can now build an image with its kernel and RAM disk in it, just as you would for bare metal or for other virtualization, and upload it as uh, as necessary. So those, mm. some of those things have evolved. Yeah, and, and I, I've, I've got a burning question in my mind. I don't know if you'll be able to answer this, so feel free to say no comment if that's the answer. But, um, sure. I, know that, uh, I know that particularly in, in the case of Amazon, they use a lot of Red Hat uh, products and so on. You guys are both kind of at Red Hat. Does that give you a, a, a maybe an easier relationship with Amazon in some way? Does that give you more access to some of their developers and engineers and so on to help you get your things going? You know, we don't we don't have any particularly special relationship with uh, the people who manage uh, the cloud side of Amazon. We have, um, mm -hmm. as as developers for Image Factory, we have not been intimately involved, for example, in the process of making RHEL available on Amazon, which it is the enterprise product. Uh, there are images available, um, but I would say generally speaking about Amazon in particular, uh, their APIs are pretty well documented. There's a fairly large community of use. Um, so it, it hasn't really been necessary to have any kind of uh, special access. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Well, that, that was a very full answer, so I appreciate it. I wasn't sure if these polit political matters, you know, you never know. Sure. Um, Hopefully I haven't gotten so, myself uh, in trouble, I don't think. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're not going to see like a, a little th hand appear from the side of your screen and grab you or something. Um, so um, one of the other things, okay, so I'm curious about um, who's using this right now and, and can you give us some kind of examples and so on of what kind of things people are, are using it for? So one of the things in the in the larger project, the goal is to make it easier for people to create collections of image types that they can then uh, launch uh, in a coordinated fashion, and that's that's aided by some other elements of the ALS project. So um, mm -hmm. I think it's we use it certainly for um, uh, primarily for building utility images of, of Fedora and Red Hat um, Enterprise Linux. Uh, we've used it for. Um, uh, you know, we actually use our own images ourselves for some of the, uh, for example, to upload an EBS style image, we have to launch a utility image in Amazon, which we've created using um, using our own tooling. Um, in terms of wider community of usage, again, we're um, we're in early days, so I'm not entirely sure what some other people mm -hmm. have been doing with it. Okay, excellent. Yeah, I mean, uh, with with a young project, it's always hard to kind of to kind of tell these things. So uh, I, I just expect that will develop as you as you kind of go along. Um, so um, we've been through a few of the providers that you support. Um, is, are there any other providers that maybe you'd want to add in future, or you're looking to add, or anyone's made a request for anything like? Well, so we're certainly interested in adding some more public cloud providers. Um, the mm -hmm. Rackspace and uh, EC2 are the two primary ones right now, and they're quite prominent, and EC2 is very prominent. Um, so there are a number of other clouds that are supported by another um, element of the ALS project, the Delta Cloud Project, which is a cloud-neutral uh, API, where it, it, uh, it talks to different back-end provider clouds but presents a unified REST interface in front of them. Um, some of the clouds, although not all of them, provide a very simple sort of image snapshotting feature that's simple enough that it can be abstracted away and exposed via Delta Cloud. So another thing we'd like to do is for those providers that allow that, um, we should be able to add pretty reasonably add support for, uh, for those where you, instead of talking to the provider through its own binding, which is what we do right now for all of them, uh, we would talk through Delta Cloud use Delta Cloud's ability to uh, execute a simple image snapshot. So uh, that's one of the big ones on our roadmap. Mm -hmm. And um, one, one that came to my mind um, was actually, I have to confess, from, from meeting the guys at a Red Hat conference is uh, Nimbula, which uh, is some of the guys who were involved in EC2 in the early days. And they've built their own cloud system that's API compatible, I believe. So have you ever looked at that? And I, I'm assuming if it's API compatible, then you could build an image using your EC2 kind of model and then ship it over. Yeah, I'm sorry, is that Open Nebula you're talking about? Uh, uh, Nimbula, they're called. Oh, the Nimbula, the okay. No, I was sort of yes, sorry. Yeah, anything, anything that's um, API compatible with EC2, particularly if it's known to work with the Botto Python binding, which is what we use, uh, it should be a pretty simple matter, yeah, to, to push to it uh, using essentially unmodified or lightly modified version of what we currently do for EC2. Mm-hmm. Excellent. Is that a public so, um, cloud, or is that a, or is it a private? Uh, is it meant to be sort of an on-premise cloud that uh, uses the EC2 API? 
Um, I believe, I don't want to get too far off the topic, but I, I believe sure. uh, from talking to the guys at, at Nimbula, they've, they've built their own uh, system and, and it has the ability for public cloud and private clouds and moving images between them and actually moving images from EC2 to uh, Nimbula, that's the kind of one of the big selling points is people who want to bring their cloud infrastructure in-house, which some people might want to do a private cloud. Um, they can do that through uh, through something like Nimbula, but I'm not here to advertise them, so I better, <laughs> I better be careful. <laughs> okay. um, all right, and so meanwhile, back at the subject, um, we yeah, I, I'm curious about the kind of the tools that you offer for for developers and stuff. So, um, what kind of stuff do you have for uh, for people to use this kind of, kind of stuff right now? So, when I download uh, Image Factory, what do I what do I get, and what do I do with it? Well, you're going to get uh, you know basically the source tree, and and our API is all uh, REST at this point. So, mm -hmm. uh, or you know, you could script against the CLI if that uh, works out better for you. But, um, you know, generally that's the, that's the support is REST. And both, mm -hmm. both interfaces uh, are able to do um, the same, you know, they're, they're feature equivalent, so. Mm -hmm. Excellent, okay. Um, so, I mean, uh, I, I was just gonna say like, so you've got, um, you've got, a f obviously it's a young project, you've got a few people be using this right now. So what kind of things have you got in mind for expansion in, in way of tools and so on? What would you like to add to your tool set that you can give to engineers and developers? Well, one one thing that I was thinking about when you were talking about uh, Nimbula is uh, mm -hmm. the ability to move mm -hmm. images off of EC2. So one of the things that we do want to work on is importing of images uh, and being able to, uh, you know, take an image that you have somewhere else, build, uh, you know, a base and target image for other clouds and then be able to push them up to uh, different providers. Yeah, I was just going to ask about that. I mean, is that something that we, you'd have to work in conjunction with uh, Image Warehouse on? Is that Would that be a combined effort or would that be... Because I think that a lot of people right now don't necessarily want to have all their eggs in one basket, right? I mean... Um, it, the wise thing would be to have kind of a, a backup plan or a way to to cut over to somebody else's uh, public cloud offering. If you're on EC2, you might want to might want to have a backup plan that says, "Look, we can migrate all this stuff very quickly to Rackspace, for example, if we have to." Right. So I mean, this, the, up this, go ahead, Sue. well, what I was going to say real quickly is that um, the tool thus far, what it allows you to do is have one representation of, you know, an image that you can push to all those different providers so that you don't have all of your eggs in one basket. Um, the importing would be, you know, if you have existing images already that you, uh, you know, don't want to go through the effort of trying to represent as a, a template mm -hmm. um, to be able to import them into the system in a, in a real easy manner. Um, but yeah, I mean that's that's really the point of of Image Factory is to avoid that cloud lock and be able to, you know, represent it once and be able to push it everywhere. Right, right. And what about private cloud? Are there people? I mean, we talked a little bit about um, you know the software, uh, the Nimbula software, things like that. I mean, I mean, uh, but really, what I think this is uh, geared towards is public cloud. But what about private cloud? People that want to do their own in-house. Uh, cloud deployments is the software equally well there? And I know you said as long as it's like EC2 compliant, it wouldn't be a well, problem. Well, actually, we have support for um, first of all, we, private cloud in the sense of being able to push to just any vSphere instance, ESX, vSphere, VMware, whatever you want to call it, uh, or Red Hat virtualization solution, RevM. Those have been um, supported from essentially the beginning. Uh, we also have support for the OpenStack project, which is uh, we, it grew out of the Rackspace public cloud initially, but is in fact a private cloud solution that you can push to. Um, so that's that's definitely it's it's we already support it, uh, and it's intended to be a target, uh, a growing target going forward. Okay, good. What about the uh, another thing that you mentioned um, in, in the notes as we were talking is the Oz project? What's the right, relationship so there? Oz is actually um, a, a library, a tool set that we use for um, to enable our initial image creation and customization. So it started, uh, it's a project, the, uh, the lead developer is a guy named Chris Lalancet. Uh, and it was originally a tool to build base uh, sort of um, minimal operating systems, minimal versions of a very large collection of operating systems in virtual machines. Um, and in fact, it still does that for us. Um, and then it also, we've added support to then customize them. So it is the engine 
for at least for the OSs that we currently support that builds and customizes the local virtual machine uh, that forms the basis of our images. Image Factory drives that through OS and then uh, there's the content within Image Factory itself uh, has all of the, the knowledge essentially to transform these images and upload them to the target clouds. So Oz is a pretty key infrastructural component for us, at least for the OSs that we support at the moment, um, Fedora and RHEL. Hmm. What, uh, um, I mean, we've had so many guests on talking about cloud. A lot of them have been uh, cloud management platforms like Scalar. Um, uh, Aeolus is another good example of cloud management. Um, and I think that we've had at least one. I was trying to find it, but I couldn't, I couldn't find it um, as we were talking. But I think there's at least one other uh, project we've had on that deals with building images um, for cloud. Do you, I just want to kind of get your take on cloud in general as far as where things are going. I mean, a lot of people see this as basically a, an iteration, um, um, a, a way to consolidate uh, certainly from the server side, but also from the whole infrastructure side, being able to consolidate your cloud. What's your take on where the cloud is going? I mean, is this, uh, um, what are we going to see in the next five to ten years if you guys look out into your crystal ball? Do you think that um, that we've reached the, the peak of where, where cloud is going to be, or is there a lot more things that are going to happen down the road? Well, that's maybe above my pay grade, but um, <laughs> I, <laughs> I would say, no, I mean, I think it, it's interesting. We've, uh, you know, one of our fundamental design decisions was to encourage people to uh, rethink the images that they were using, build images from the ground up for use in the cloud. Um, so that's why importing, for example, was not a primary focus in the early part of the project. Um, and I, we did that because we thought that in order to really leverage these tools, people had to think in terms of images that they launched that were perhaps short-lived, um, perhaps were stateless, uh, things like that. And I think there's still quite a bit, it seems like there's quite a bit of evolution going on in, um, in that space. People coming to terms with how to build applications as a collection of images that may come and go, a collection of instances that may come and go. Uh, separating state out, not even necessarily into like a database server, but maybe into simply a state service, something like S3 or, or you know, something similar to that. Um, and I, my personal impression is that that process is still very much ongoing, uh, that people are learning how to deploy and build multi-tier applications in that way. Whereas in the, you know, even five years ago, it was you would get a collection of physical servers, you'd spend a great deal of time customizing them, you might lose some of the details of how that happened. You had a lot invested in, you know, what uniquely went into those physical systems. Um, and we're hoping to get a, I think people are hoping to get away from that in cloud. Um, so so an, an abstraction from all of the physical, a true abstraction, let's say, from all the physical stuff. Right now there is abstraction. In other words, like if you're using uh, EC2, um, you don't know, for example, what brand of disk drive your, you know, your data is sitting on and things like that. Um, but you, you think it'll go even even a lev level higher than that, where you just have everything's generic and um, you don't even care anymore. I think that's certainly the promise of it. That's the hope. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, it's certainly not easy. It's much. Uh, it, it's quite a bit easier to uh, sort of uh, do whatever local customization you need and be comfortable with it, back it up, and have that be the end of it. But the promise is in terms of being able to migrate, being able to scale, if you can define things very abstractly. Um, you know, as a collection of images that collaborate, and maybe maybe you don't even know where they're running. Maybe they move back and forth. Um, that seems to me to be quite a powerful possibility. Right, right. And that's, of course, if you're still rooted in the infrastructure, you know, aspect of cloud. You know, we're seeing such a great uh, move forward in the platform aspect of cloud with things like OpenShift and Heroku and, you know, Engine Yard and things like that. So I think, you know, we we definitely have not hit the peak in terms of what cloud capabilities are. I, I think that there's still quite a bit of uh, progress to be made, and you know there's a great future ahead. Hmm. Okay, guys. So we've talked um, a lot about Image Factory, but is there anything that we haven't covered that you'd like our listeners to know that that we should really talk about? I would just encourage people to come uh, look at the website, join IRC, join the mailing list, and check it out. Excellent. 
Okay, yeah, that's great. Uh, that, that sounds like we've, we've almost covered everything. That's, that's good. We like that. Um, <laughs> cool. All right. And so Randall's not here this week, as everyone will have realized. But um, we, I need to ask you his favorite questions, which he always asks. And I think I know some of the answers to this. So I'll ask you in turn. Uh, so, Steve, we'll start with you, if that's okay. Um, uh, Vim or Emacs? Vim. Oh, okay. Randall won't like that one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Ian, same question? Pass. <laughs> okay, and uh, and the other one we always ask, I'll ask Steve first, is favourite scripting language? Oh, uh, I guess Python. Okay, that's a good answer, I like that one. Uh, and Ian, same again? Oh, it's going to be Python, I'm afraid. Python, okay, that's good. Well, Randall's not here, so somewhere in the Mediterranean right now, he's probably screaming, but, yeah. um, yeah, <laughs> but, he's not, but never mind. He's not going to care. Actually, Steve, you're fairly new to open source software development, correct? Yeah, that's correct. Uh, most of my career has been in uh, more of a closed environment. Um, I've had a couple of dabblings here and there, but this is the first time I've been able to work on open source uh, as a day-to-day -day responsibility. So mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's good. I really like, you know... I like the atmosphere at Red Hat, and I like, you know, what we're doing, and I think that this is a good project to be on. Okay, good, good. That's good to hear. Are you also new to open source tools, or were you a user of open source uh, uh, previous, just not contributing to open source projects? Uh, yeah, no, I've, been a, I've been a user, you know, for a long time. I've uh, cut my teeth on Slackware, the early days of Slackware, so... Good. So you didn't have to necessarily make a transition like from Windows to Linux or uh, no. uh, Virtual Basic or something to <laughs> to Python. You actually were using those tools before. Right. Okay. Cool. Cool. Well, welcome to the uh, open source community. We're glad to have you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. And and uh, and Ian, you're you're not so new to open source. You've been doing this a while. No, I started using Linux in the sort of mid late '90s um, and uh, have made a career out of it. I was previously at uh, VA Linux, uh, and I've been in at Red Hat for, uh, I guess, going on 12 years now. Excellent. Well, thank you very much for coming on and talking, us, uh, talking to us today, guys. We, uh, we really appreciate it, and uh, we wish you the best of luck. As you say, it's, it's a relatively young project, so we, we, we look to the future to see great things from, from you guys, and, and we're all really excited. So thanks for coming on and joining us. Thank you very much. Thanks for having thank us you. again. No problem, no problem at all. So, um, yeah, a really interesting product there. What, what did you think, Aaron? Well, all of these projects are interesting, and I, I really think it's a, a good sign that um, uh, that the open source communities in general, uh, th this project happens to be sponsored by Red Hat, but it's all open source code. Mm -hmm. um, I, I just think it's great that uh, the open source developers are actually jumping on the, the, the cloud I want to say the cloud bandwagon. I mean, but um, that, that may be trivializing it a little bit too much. I mean, it's a huge opportunity. It's a huge uh, area of interest right now for uh, companies as they look for, you know, what's my next um, uh, version of this particular software package or what's my next version of, of the way that I run my business? How am I going to support that? And right now, they're all looking at cloud saying, hey, this sounds great. And there's a lot of work going on. So I just think it's really great that, that you know, we talk a lot about uh, about cloud on this show because that, there's just so many projects in cloud going on right now. Uh, and, you know, of course, we want to make people aware of those. So it may sound like we're, we're beating a dead horse sometimes. We're really not. I mean, there's just so many good projects out there. And uh, I'm, just, uh, I'm just excited. This one sounds really good. I mean, if I was, uh, you know, deploying uh, a lot of images... Um, that had to be customized, you know, not stock images, but images uh, that I was deploying for, uh, for, uh, 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 to support mm -hmm. my business. This is definitely a project I would be looking at very seriously. Yeah, and it really is a growing area. Um, I was at uh, a Red Hat conference actually last year where uh, Jim Whitehurst, the CEO, joked that uh, he can't give a speech these days or, or a, a keynote unless it includes the word cloud or he's not allowed to write, get, it through, the, you know, get yeah. it through the legal department or whatever. So it really is growing right now. But um, do, do you think it, it's, I mean, we talked a little bit about the future of the cloud there and it's good to see that the guys are kind of um, talking about trying to mitigate that lock-in, the potential lock-in of the, all these proprietary clouds that are around. Do you think we're going to see, because we've got open standards, right now do you think we'll see eventually open standards winning out in the cloud or, or, or how do you think how do you think it will go i think so i mean this isn't like the linux desktop battle right where there was already incumbents uh there beforehand and and you're really fighting a, a uphill battle the whole way i mean this is really since since the uh, open source projects have embraced this concept uh from the very get-go and it really is a concept i mean there's nothing proprietary in theory about 
cloud and the way cloud is deployed. I mean, I think it's very helpful that Amazon jumped on early and supported Linux distributions uh, from, from the get-go. I think that, and actually in this case, Linux has had a distinct advantage in that it was able to adapt uh, um, you know, the way things work to, to a cloud uh, ecosystem very quickly. And then, you know, later on, you, you've seen other players try to get in the, in the, in the game. So I think that uh, um, uh, Linux in general and open source has a distinct advantage here over the, the proprietary systems. Mm, yeah, I, w I would definitely agree. And uh, interestingly, very recently, we've seen in the news that uh, VMware have actually joined the OpenStack Foundation, mm -hmm. which seems like a, a strange marriage at first. But uh, I mean, even they're getting in there. So this, this stuff is really taken off and the OpenStack movement and so on. Right. OK, then. So um, this, I'm going to do Randall's awkward transition for the week. Um, we should look at who we've got coming up on the show. Uh, Randall will be back uh, in the next week or so. And uh, we've got some exciting shows coming up. Uh, um, so next week, we're going to be joined by, uh, I'm I'm going to get these names wrong, so I apologize in advance. Guillaume Binet and Tali Petrova. I hope I didn't get those two wrong. Uh, who are going to talk about Er Chatbot. That's E R R Chatbot, which is a plugin chatbot that you can use for all kinds of different things. So that sounds quite cool. Um, the following week, uh, that will be the 14th. The following week, we've got uh, Dwayne Bailey, who's going to come on and talk about Pootle, which is a, a, a platform, a, um, a portal, a web portal to enable translations to uh, help make translation easier, which sounds very cool. So we look forward to that. And then the following week, on the 21st of November, we've got David Mason coming on to talk to us about Zenata, which should be cool as well. Um, now, if you you, uh, have a look if you go to uh, twit.tv slash floss you'll see a link on our page there to our upcoming schedule we have a spreadsheet that you can look at which has all our upcoming guests on it so if you go there and you have a look and you think there's a project missing that you'd really like to see um, then the best thing you can do is uh, contact the project leader yourself or contact the project and have them email uh, Randall, which is his address, is Merlin at Stonehenge.com, and that's the easiest way to get to the top of our our schedule list, and um, so we can get them on and talk to them because we always like to know what what you guys want to hear about, what what projects you want to see on the show. Um, okay, then. So if you want to uh, watch the show, you can do. You want to listen to the show, watch the show live. Uh, we tape at 8:30 uh, a.m. Pacific time, and uh, apart from my time zone mess ups, we we should be fine for that time. And uh, yeah, it's uh, live at uh, live.twit.tv if you want to over there we've got an irc channel which is at uh, also over there you can find details on the page and we've got people chatting away right now in the irc channel you can find us on uh, twitter facebook all those kind of places google plus so just have a look for floss weekly and uh, and come along and find us now um if you want to find anything about what i'm doing at the moment you can uh, head to my website which is danlynch.org where i've been writing about uh, things like android this week uh, i've been writing about pimping sms on your on your android phone i still like sms i know it's a bit old-fashioned these days but i still use SMS a lot. Um, so, Aaron, what have you got coming up? Uh, same thing. If you want to follow me, uh, definitely check out uh, Add Me to Your Circles on Google+. Plus. That's the easiest way to actually start a discussion. If you just don't want to start a discussion, you just want to read what I have to say, uh, you can also follow me on Facebook or Twitter. Uh, but Google+, Plus is definitely the best way. I talk a lot about making things, Raspberry Pi, Android, um, uh, Star Wars franchise being bought by Disney, <laughs> uh, all those kind of things. So if, if that's the kind of stuff you're interested in, Linux, open source, making stuff, um, definitely follow me on Google+. Plus. Excellent. And thank you very much for, for uh, joining us today, Aaron. It's always a pleasure. And, uh, yeah, and it, it's great to finally do a show again together. Yeah, definitely. I know you've been pretty busy lately, or it seems like, anyway. Uh, so it's good to be mm -hmm. back on together again. We, we don't get the chance very often when Randall's around. Uh, so it's kind of nice when he goes away. It's like, yeah, go ahead, Randall. I get to talk to interesting people like Dan and Simon last week. and So, yeah, yeah it's fun. Yeah, well, well, the cat's away. The mice right. will play. That's right. As they, as they say. <laughs> yeah. um, not sure how Randall will feel about being compared to a cat, but there we go. Uh, maybe he won't mind. Um, so thank you very much for joining us for Floss Weekly, and we'll see you again for another Floss Weekly.